Developer Advocate at Applitudes, and also Director of Test Automation University. Today, I want to talk about visual testing. But first, let's start with a game of Who Done It. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take oh. her away. That's right, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Did you happen to notice those changes? Or at least the biggest one, where the dead man got up and walked away? Probably not, right? And that's because we all suffer with what's called inintentional blindness. And this is where you miss things that are unexpected that come into your viewport. And the reason you miss these things is because you're so focused on a specific task that anything else goes unnoticed. And this is especially true when we talk about testing our software, right? When we do do our testing, we test whatever the feature is that we've just written and we miss a lot of the background noise that could be occurring. So how do we solve for this? Well, typically, we automate the test, right? Because if we automate the test, then we know it's going to take the same steps every single time and it's going to make the same verifications every single time. Therefore, I won't miss anything. But what if I told you that automating your tests when doing so, you're actually scripting in the unintentional blindness because your scripts are only going to do and verify whatever it is you told it to do and verify. For example, what about the look and feel of the application, right? So a lot of the testing tools that we use today, they interrogate the DOM in order to answer your questions. For example, is this text showing on the screen? It's going to look in the DOM and it's going to say, yep, I see it in the DOM, it's showing on the screen. But what about if that text was the same color as the background? What about if that text was being covered by some other element? What about if that text was bleeding off the edge of the page, which is often the case when we start changing viewport sizes, all right? Your scripts are unable to catch these sorts of things. And a lot of times people will say, well, huh, that's interesting, but we don't really have problems like that. Well, I'm here to tell you that everyone has problems like this. Companies big and small. Let me show you a couple of examples. Here's Cineworld. Cineworld is the second largest cinema chain in the world. And they had a visual bug on the page that asked you if you want to store your credit card. Notice here, the labels are not aligned with the radio buttons. This seems a little small on the surface, right? But when you think about this, you have your customers who are tweeting about it. People are losing trust. I don't know about you. I would not store my credit card information on this page. Because me as a user, as a customer, I'm thinking if they didn't catch this, then I know they didn't test 
the back end of it either, right? I don't know what you all are doing with my credit card. I don't want to store it. So your customers start losing faith and trust in your product. Now, this tweet is implying that this company, they don't even test their happy path. But I have a theory. I think they did test this. In fact, I think they automated the test. Again, whatever tools they're using is querying the DOM. Is this label present? Yes. Is this label present? Yes. What about those two radio buttons? They're there. And functionally, this works. But from a user perspective, we can see this as an issue. Here's another one. This is Open Table. I was going to go to uh, North Carolina and meet up with some of my friends. I used to live there years ago, so I was going to meet up with quite a few friends. It's going to be a party of seven of us. And I wanted to make a reservation at my favorite barbecue. It's North Carolina's known for barbecue, right? So the pit is the place that I chose and I needed to select the time. So I chose 7 p.m. Now when I chose 7 p.m., a modal appeared and I was a little bit confused at first because there's nothing in the center here. However, I can see that there are actually two select buttons here. However, they're not aligned, right? Not only are they not aligned, I don't really know what I'm selecting. So I did what any of you would do, and I opened up Chrome DevTools and began to dig around to figure out what are these buttons and what's going on. And when I did that, I realized that the labels actually were there. They were just as far away from the buttons as possible. Fortunately, I'm an engineer, so I'm able to do this sort of thing and continue on and make the reservation because I still want this barbecue. But most of the open table customers, they're not developers. They're not opening Chrome dev tools. They don't even know about it, right? They're not digging through the DOM in order to use your application. And if they're a millennial like I am, they certainly aren't going to give you a phone call. No, they're just going to go and find another restaurant for their party. So I, I, I'm thinking about how much business is lost with this bug here, right? This is a visual bug. And if we think about it, Technically, it works. Functionally, it's fine. Uh, if we had our test that we're interrogating the DOM, yes, it would be able to click the right button and make the reservation. And OpenTable probably has these automated. And it said, yep, push to prod, right? Now, these aren't just one-offs. It happens to your favorite tech companies as well. Happens to Amazon. At a point of sale, someone is wanting to multiply the amount of money that they're spending and they're faced with this. Happens to Facebook. In their marketplace, someone is wanting to buy stuff and the text is all goofy, right? Happens to Instagram. This is sponsored content, meaning someone paid for their advertisement to show up. And I'm sure they didn't expect it to look like this, where all the text was jumbled. Again, in all of these instances, the test was still passed, right? Is this text present? Is this text present? Is this text present? Yes, all of it's present. However, it looks like this. Happens to Twitter. Look at these tweets overlapping. What do you do as a user? You close the app, right? You don't want to deal with this. Even happens to Google. And I almost didn't put this one in because it doesn't feel like such a big deal. However, this is a point of sale. They're not going to let that sit like that, which means some highly paid engineer now has to go and chase down this goofy bug. The great news is that we don't have to live like this. So visual validation can be automated. We can add these to our tests. Let me tell you what visual validation is. So visual validation or visual testing, it's where you take a screenshot of your application when it's in its pristine state, right? This is the golden master. Yes, it looks great, right? And then on your regression runs, you can take another screenshot and you compare the two. Now, visual testing is not something that's entirely new in the industry. In fact, it's been around for quite a while. However, the technique that we were using as an industry, not so great for testing. What we were doing was comparing the pictures, pixel by pixel. Ah, very flaky, right? Let me show you what I mean. And this first example here, this is where we say, okay, this is our application in its great state. And then in the second picture is a regression run. Comparing these two, they fail. 
The reason why is that the Google search button is bolded in the second example. Well, if you happen to be hovering over that button, that's the effect that it has. This is an automated script, which means when this was running, the mouse happened to be right there, right? So now you need to try to account for this kind of stuff so that your tests don't break. No, no one wants to do that. Here's another one. This one also fails. The reason why is the cursor is solid in the first one, but not the second one. Well, cursors blink. So if you happen to take the picture when the cursor is solid and then another time when it's not, now you have a failure and your deployment is gated and stopped. Not great, right? Good news is that Applitudes has come up with a newer technique to do this using machine learning. So it uses AI to be able to mimic how the human brain and eye looks at something and be able to compare it in that way and only flag the differences that matter. Specifically, this was made for testing. So I ran this little spot the difference game through a pixel to pixel comparison and then I ran it through Applitude's AI. I'm not going to let you all play because you let the dead man walk away, but let me show you what I found. So in pixel to pixel, notice how sensitive this is. It flags pretty much everything. Even little white space shifts make a difference here. This is not great for testing applications. Versus we ran this through Applitude's Eyes API and it spotted what we would spot as human beings. So this is more suitable for testing. All right, so let's add it to an existing code base. So here is the application we're going to look at. It's a single page app, very simple and straightforward. I have eight of my favorite books on testing and you can filter these books by typing in, you know, title or partial title or author name or whatever, okay? So for example, let's look at the first test and say that we actually type in test here. Notice here, it filtered down all the books that have test in the title. Okay, and here's the test for that. So let me walk you through it. We say, okay, our query is going to be test. Here are the books that we expect to come back. So it's an array of those five titles. And then we say, okay, add that test to that search field, right? So we're going to search for that. And now we get into the validation. So we're going to validate that there are these many number of books, however many is in this array here. And then we're going to loop through that and make sure each of those titles is actually one of those visible books. Okay, great. However, I want to add a little CSS now, right? Now, just like all of you, I'm not a CSS whiz either. <laughs> no one is, right? Well, maybe a few people. But, you know, let's say I pick up a little bit of CSS and I'm trying to play around with the application and I was going for this bouncy effect, but I added this line here, line six. Now, because I have tests, I can just check this in, right? Because I have tests. That means I can do whatever I want and the test will catch any errors. So, I check this in. I run my test again, and this is what the application looks like. With that one line of CSS, I literally flip this application on its head. What did my test say? My test passed. How? Because it's querying the DOM, right? So it's asking the DOM, how many books are visible? She says she wanted five of them. Yep, you got five, great. Perfect. Okay, of those five, she said these are the titles. Are all those titles visible too? Yep, they are. Great. Perfect. Ship it. And this is what we ship. This is why we need the visual testing. Okay, so how do we add the visual testing? It's very simple. It's three commands, line three, four, and five. So we say, open your eyes. Poetry, right? Because that's the API. It's called eyes. So open your eyes and we say check the window. That check window call does the screenshot. So this takes the screenshot, it sends it up to the Applitude's cloud, stores it there, does the comparisons and everything like that. So the very first time you run it, you don't have a baseline. 
it creates the picture it makes that your baseline and then for all your regression runs it's going to compare it to that baseline final call close your eyes we're done here beautiful right so now when we run that it runs with Cypress, and I'm running that in Cypress, but it can run with any of your favorite tools, right? Okay, so I, I run this in Cypress. The Cypress test fails, but then it also provides a link so that you can come to the Applitudes dashboard, which is hosting all of your images and test runs, okay? So here we see that it flags. Doing the visual testing, it was able to see, oh, no, this is not right. You messed up, which is perfect. OK, so let's talk about some pros and cons with this approach. Well, a pro is that I'm testing everything. I've totally removed that unintentional blindness. However, a con is that I'm testing everything. Right. <laughs> so everything on this page is being tested when in reality, I might not want to test everything on a page. For example, I don't care about testing that title of the page. Uh, what's entered in the search bar is questionable. If there was anything else going on on this page, I might not care about it. Right. Fortunately, the Eyes API is extremely flexible. So I can narrow this down. Instead of saying, check the entire window, I can pass in some arguments and say, no, all right, go for this window, but I want to target a specific region, and here's my CSS selector for that region, right? So when I do that, now it's only going to take a picture of that specific region, and this becomes what it verifies against, ignoring everything else, right? Okay, pros and cons. Pro is that we scope this down. Now it's narrow and it's just what we want to test. Con, we scope this down, <laughs> right? So we can miss some things. For example, let's say that our application, the filter part was broken and I entered in test and nothing filtered. Would our visual test pass or would it fail? It would pass because remember what we just said is scope this down to this specific book. So it's going to find this specific book. It's going to say, oh, yes, take a picture. It looks beautiful. And we've added back that unintentional blindness where it missed everything else that was going on around it. Namely, that the search feature doesn't even work. Right. So you have to be smart about this, even though it's using AI. A lot of times people think AI is all knowing. That's not true. As an engineer, you still need to think this stuff through. Right. So we can fix up our test by coupling it with functional assertions as well. Right. A couple of things we could do. Actually, we could scope it not just to this book, but this, to this entire search results area or if you just want to scope it to the book that's fine but I would couple that with line three by adding another functional assertion back in there so I want to do the visual and the functional together I can do this this doesn't have to replace everything that you have okay all right. Um, also can do dynamic content. So uh, if the page like it's going to have ads or, you know, you don't know what the content is going to be, but there is a static structure, like think about Twitter or news sites, things like that. You don't know what it's going to say, but it has a specific layout. You can uh, validate this as well by just adding this line five match levels. So there's multiple match levels that you can use. Doing so, notice here I ran the test and it still passed even though in the first example we have advanced selenium followed by cucumber and the second one we have cucumber followed by advanced selenium. This still passed because it uses machine learning to detect the pattern of the page and it looks great. So we're good to go. All right. Another thing you can do with the visual testing is test across multiple devices. So this works kind of like magic. <laughs> um, you don't have to write like all of these different tests for all of these different viewports and configurations. You write your test just one time. And what this is going to do when you're ready to verify, you call eyes and you give it like the list of the configurations that you want to go after, it grabs your state of your application. So the DOM, 
the CSS, JS, all of this stuff, and it blasted onto multiple configurations all in parallel, so it's really, really fast. So here's how I specify what configurations I want. Um, lines 4 through 11, so I have this browser array with these objects here, each one specifying a configuration. So I want Firefox, Chrome, and um, IE 11, and you can specify like the different uh, viewport sizes. I want iPhone 10, I want Galaxy, I want iPhone 10 in both landscape and portrait. Also support for Edge and Safari, all the works, right? I don't have to touch my test. My test remains the same, right? But what this is going to do is blast that state. And when I say blast the state, it's not executing all of the steps. It's grabbing the state, which makes it amazingly fast. All right. So given that, I get to see like what my application would look like in all of these different states. And the test runs across all of these. And you see these are the configurations over here on the right. So super nice. Also works with uh, storybook components. So if you want to verify your components, you can do so. There's support for Angular, Vue, and React. And it also works on the grid as well. So you can see how all of your components look in all of these different viewports in browsers and phones and things. So pretty nice. All right, so that's visual testing in a nutshell. Thank you so much for your time. What questions can I answer?